shall dedicate myself to your service. Not based upon some rigid creed, but bound together by ideals and aspirations. Elizabeth II, Britain's longest serving monarch. She's reigned over this country for nearly 70 years. She's a woman of remarkable stamina. She's the most famous woman in the world. She's seen a man land on the moon and 14 prime ministers come and go. But 400 years earlier, there was another Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth I is this brilliant, genius queen. Now, we're setting the two Elizabeths side by side to see if, despite the centuries, there is more that unites than divides them. The idea of comparing the two Elizabeths is immensely fascinating. It might look on the surface that they have nothing in common, but when you dig a little deeper, the story becomes even more extraordinary. We'll compare the lives and personalities of the two queens. Separated by centuries, but confronting almost identical problems. To discover the surprisingly similar struggles they both faced. She had to fight for her right to the throne. And the battle they both fought to protect their reigns. At the core of each woman is a very strong will for their country as a whole. These two powerful women, neither of whom were ever meant to be queen, and both of whom became the most successful queens in history. It may be hard to believe now, but two of our greatest monarchs were once royal nobodies. Queen Elizabeth II was born Elizabeth Windsor, a minor princess in the second rank of the royal family. She's the daughter of Prince Bertie, the stuttering, unremarkable younger brother of the heir to the throne. Not only was there no prospect of her becoming queen, but her father, the Duke of York, as he then was, was the spare, and so the pressure was totally off the York household, as it was known. Growing up away from the limelight, Elizabeth enjoys an idyllic childhood. Her parents take advantage of their lesser status and lighter duties to dedicate themselves to family life. She was brought up close to us and the horses. That was a privileged way of life, but also in terms of the emotional warmth and closeness, relatively unusual for the time. She developed a real bond and affection with her father. If you look at some of those very moving, wonderfully heartwarming photographs of, of uh, the Queen and Princess Margaret with their parents, the wee four. In 1936, Elizabeth's uncle David becomes King Edward VIII. He is expected to have a family of his own, pushing Elizabeth even further down the royal pecking order. Elizabeth was really a minor princess living in the townhouse, excluded, expected just to make a happy marriage. Elizabeth I also starts out as a royal outsider. But her childhood couldn't have been more different. Elizabeth Tudor is the firstborn of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. Henry has split with the Catholic Church, divorced his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, and married Anne Boleyn, all so he can produce a male heir. So when Elizabeth was born, it was a case of, oh dear. She was, of course, expected to be a boy, but she wasn't quite what was expected. And so there was a sense of a sort of bittersweet celebration at her birth. To make matters worse, Elizabeth's mother, Anne Boleyn, goes on to have several miscarriages. And eventually, Henry VIII tires of his second wife too. Anne is accused of adultery and executed. Elizabeth has lost her mother at a painfully young age. She wasn't 
told of the full brutality of the facts. But she was a very precocious young girl and she noticed that something had changed immediately. That lady who used to visit her visits her no longer. Something had changed in the atmosphere around her. Elizabeth is punished for her mother's disgrace. She's stripped of the title princess, demoted lady, and sent to live in isolation with a governess. In the following years, Henry VIII remarries and finally has a son and heir, Edward. But a series of letters show Elizabeth continues to be ignored by her father. What? during her childhood. So Lady Brian here, so she's looking after the motherless Elizabeth, and she's pleading with him to supply her with clothes. And so Lady Brian says here that she has neither kirtle nor petticoat nor linen or kerchiefs. And so the list goes on. It's clear that poor old Elizabeth has been completely forgotten about. She's just cast adrift, couldn't be further from the throne if she tried. Nobody would have ever guessed that there were much greater things to come if you read this letter. But an extraordinary series of events will soon change everything for both Elizabeths. In late 1936, when Princess Elizabeth Windsor is just 10 years old, her uncle, King Edward VIII, falls in love with the American divorcee Wallace Simpson. But as head of the Church of England, he isn't allowed to marry her. So in a shock decision, King Edward VIII abdicates. When she first hears, she is at home in their house in Piccadilly, and they hear people outside shouting, God save the king. And Elizabeth goes to a footman and asks what's happening, and he tells her that her uncle's abdicated and her father is now king. With her father promoted, Elizabeth is now heir to the throne. And in an instant, her life is set on a new path. No one in the royal family wants to become queen or king. They think it's a huge job, too much responsibility, too much pressure, and all that pressure placed on a 10-year-old girl who, up until then, had expected to become a farmer's wife. Now she's going to have to take on the big job. She's going to have to be queen. The stay-at-home father Elizabeth is used to is now a busy full-time monarch. And she is placed in intensive tuition for constitutional history to prepare herself to reign. Her close-knit family life has come to an end. Her uncle's abdication scarred the monarchy and scarred the family, and in many ways it shaped Elizabeth II's own monarchy as well extreme almost excessive concern for duty for self-restraint surely came from her uncle's dereliction of duty as one looks at the evolving personality of elizabeth ii from childhood the outgoing bubbly little girl evolved into a rather withdrawn personality and I think that is the weight of responsibility upon her. 400 years before her, young Elizabeth Tudor is on a tumultuous path of her own. It's interesting. Both Elizabeths had a rocky road to the throne. Elizabeth II came to the throne through great trauma for the monarchy. Elizabeth I, heaven knows, she was in the succession, she was out of it. She had to fight for her right to the throne. When the neglected Elizabeth Tudor is 13 years old, her father Henry VIII dies, and her half-brother Edward becomes king. But the sickly boy passes away just a few years later. And in his place, Elizabeth's Catholic half-sister Mary becomes queen. She sees Elizabeth as a rival and throws her into the Tower of London. Elizabeth I had an incredibly traumatic childhood. First, her mother is executed, then her sister, Mary, puts her in the tower and nearly chops off her head. Really as traumatic as you could imagine. Her life is under threat. She's constantly having to 
change the mood of the people in power in order to increase her chances of survival. But while she is held prisoner, Mary's health goes downhill and powerful Protestant factions push for Elizabeth to be named her successor. Mary refused to acknowledge Elizabeth as the princess, but Elizabeth is very much a symbol of Protestant hope in Mary's Catholic England. Mary dies not long afterwards, and in a remarkable turnaround of fortunes, in 1559, Elizabeth is rushed to Westminster Abbey and crowned Queen of England. Here is Elizabeth, 25 years old, who has suddenly realized that rather than being a prisoner and in danger of life, she's now the queen. And so finally, Elizabeth had her day. She was queen, but nobody could ever have predicted that would happen. I think that our best monarchs in history come from obscurity. You have these two young girls out there, and then they're catapulted into a new position. And that, to me, is a fascinating parallel. At exactly the same age, just 25 years old, Elizabeth Windsor is in Kenya on a royal tour when she's told some unexpected news. Her father, King George VI, has suddenly died at the age of just fifth. His battle with lung cancer has been kept from Elizabeth and her sister. It was an utter, utter shock to her. She expected her father to go on. He was just a young man. The country had been told he was fine because all the royal family were in denial, as were the courtiers. Only, I think, the king himself knew what was coming. Everyone knew that Princess Elizabeth was going to become Elizabeth II, but no one realized it would happen then. Elizabeth left England as a princess. She flew back only a week later as queen. Both Elizabeths have taken an unpredictable road to the throne, filled with trauma and disruption. But their experiences will make them strong. That neither Elizabeth was supposed to be queen. That tortuous path meant that they don't have that sense of entitlement, as if they had been born to rule. They're perhaps more aware of the enormity of their situation, actually, the challenges that they might face in not having been groomed for queenship. They never take it for granted. The two new queens will need all their strength and resilience. And right from the start of their reign, Elizabeth I and II face a surprisingly similar issue. What to do about the men in their lives? You'd think that 400 years later that it really wouldn't matter in the same way, but guess what? The same questions keep on coming up. And there is one desire that the two queens have in common. Both women are determined to marry for love. The similarities are not just between the two Elizabeths, but between the two men in their lives. And I think this is indulging, really, their passionate side, their wilder side. They want a partner who is different to themselves. When Elizabeth I takes the throne, she is still a single woman. An unacceptable situation in the 16th century. And she is expected to marry as soon as possible. Women at the time were understood to be more sexually voracious than men. And in order to remain chaste, which of course was the absolute imperative of any woman before marriage, not least the queen, they needed to get on and get married. Elizabeth's male advisers want her to marry an influential lord or foreign prince and secure a powerful alliance. But the queen seems to have other ideas. She's spending every spare moment with her handsome master of the Robert Dudley. Dudley is of two people who are so familiar with each other and know the way each other thinks almost. But there's also a real sense of that private relationship quite often coming into tension with their public persona. Dudley is not a popular suitor for the Queen. Elizabeth's master of the horse is penniless and from disgraced lineage. 
Robert Dudley came from a family of executed traitors. All around were horrified by his rise in her favour. Who was this jumped-up young man whose tall, dark, good looks and charismatic ways seemed to be bowling over the new young queen? And there is another major problem. Robert Dudley is already married. So he was perhaps, perhaps the great love of her life, but a man that really she could never marry. I think it's interesting that both queens are obviously drawn to very attractive, very charismatic men. They're not just going to go for the safe option, if you like. Elizabeth II's choice of man may not be married, but in many other ways, Prince Philip of Greece is another Robert Dudley. It's really curious when you look at it, how actually similar Robert Dudley and Philip are. Yes, they're both incredibly handsome, marvelous soldiers, great on a horse, but also both of them were seen as from a slightly down market family. Philip's family, they've lost the crown, they're in exile, they are dispossessed. He has no home. He was actually mocked when he had no address right down in the Balmoral guest book. So there's no one in Elizabeth II's life who agrees with her marrying Philip. But unlike Elizabeth I, Elizabeth II won't be kept apart from the man she loves. The Queen marries Philip before she is crowned. She is determined to marry Philip. She wants him. She sees him as her perfect husband. She fell in love with him when she was 13 and never had eyes for anyone else. But as soon as Elizabeth II becomes Queen, there is the question of where her husband Philip sits in the royal hierarchy. He wants a senior royal role in the family as head of the household. Prince Philip's ambitious uncle, Lord Mountbatten, was heard at a dinner party boasting that the house of Mountbatten now sat on the throne. And this caused outrage with the old Queen Mary, with the Queen Mother. Meek and mild daughter would get pushed around by this brusque naval officer. Elizabeth has to make a choice. Give in to her husband and make him an equal partner. Or follow her advisers and make Philip take a back seat. OK, so we're in 1953. Elizabeth II has been ruling only for a few months. And I think what's interesting is the sense of space. Everyone arrayed around greeting the monarch. And, of course, hubby in the background, quite literally two steps behind. That dynamic, you can't have any ambiguity here, that Elizabeth is the ruler, Elizabeth is the queen, and Philip awkward, shifting around, not sure where to look. He is always going to be the bit part here. The centre stage, the focus of this relationship between the two of them is, of course, Elizabeth. Philip is named Queen's consort and nothing more. And he's told to spend his life locked exactly two steps behind his wife. His role is supportive. It is never as the star. I think this was a very tough decision for Elizabeth II because the Queen was deeply conventional in all other respects, but she was having to fly in the face of that and actually establish her own superiority over her husband. And arguably, both queens had to make a choice between love and duty, and both chose duty. But they did it very differently, of course. But it's interesting that they were both faced with this same conundrum. Two years into Elizabeth I's reign, she finally has the opportunity to marry a forbidden love. Dudley's wife, Amy, has died suddenly in a fall, and he's now a single man. But the circumstances of his wife's death are hugely controversial. She was found at the bottom of a staircase, and rumours circulated that perhaps even the Queen had been involved. Her death was just rather too convenient. There's a lot of gossip in the court, as is inevitable in this period. But at this particular moment, those gossips really 
turn vicious. As the backlash grows, Elizabeth fears the scandal could endanger her hold on the crown. And she makes the heart-wrenching decision that she can never marry Robert Dudley. I think the one thing that she proves is that she's going to prioritize her duty over her personal affairs of the heart. Ultimately, what as a woman. Denied the man she loves, Elizabeth takes drastic action to solve the problem of who will be her husband. In a statement to Parliament, she resolves never to marry. I think it's absolute genius uh, crafting of a speech because she turns it on them. You are all my children. I don't need to get married. I've got you, all my subjects, as my children. And then this is the masterstroke at the end when she says, when I have expired my last breath, this may be inscribed upon my tomb. Here lies interred Elizabeth, a virgin pure until her death. She's solving the problem of a man in a queen's life by just refusing to make a decision. And this says it all. I will not, in so deep a matter, wade with so shallow a wit. There was nothing shallow about Elizabeth's wit. Both Elizabeths have navigated the challenge of love and marriage with different but equal skill. It seems, for both of them, the crown comes first and men must come second. But they still face a difficult battle to win over their people. Today, we may think of Elizabeth I and Elizabeth II as two of our most popular and successful monarchs. But it wasn't always this way. A few years into their reigns, both queens are seen as weak and incapable. And there are real doubts about their ability to do the job. What does this naive young woman know about running a country? Women aren't fit to rule because they're too emotional, they're not rational enough. You see these two women coming to the throne, and it's a fight. It's a huge fight. Winston Churchill, thinking about dealing with Elizabeth II, he cried. He said, she's just a child. I mean, she was 25 with two small children, but to him, she was a baby, and that's because she was a woman. At the start of their reigns, both queens have a real problem finding a way to project themselves as female leaders. In Elizabeth I's first portrait, she doesn't look like a commanding ruler. She looks like a, an awkward cardboard cutout with her hunched shoulders and, and pinched waist and the awkward placement of her hands as though she doesn't quite know what to do with them. This is not someone who would particularly inspire confidence in us. And that's, I think, very similar to how Elizabeth II felt when she started relations in New York in this enormous building and with these men flanking her. Here she is, this sort of solitary figure, slightly hunched or even hiding behind the podium and the lectern. And that same theme, I think, of hesitancy and awkwardness. So these two queens almost mirror images of each other, separated by centuries, but at the same time confronting almost identical problems. Both Elizabeths need to win the love and the respect of their people. And on further investigation, it seems the two queens use a very similar approach to help turn it around. During a visit to Australia and New Zealand, Elizabeth II introduces the royal walkabout for the first time. The informal and totally unrehearsed interaction with the crowd is unheard of in royal circles. And it's a spectacular success. It's now stamped indelibly on the identity of the royal family. That's what royal folk do. They go out and mingle. And there's a real message there, you know. She's saying, I care about you. You matter to me. And we can now see consciously or not, she was reviving a technique of Elizabeth I's. Elizabeth I was the first ever monarch to approach ordinary people and talk to them directly. Elizabeth I 
is actually unprecedented in the way that she goes out there and she does greet her public. I have to say that it gives the security men around her utter kittens. I mean, they're panicking that the Catholics are going to blow her up. But Elizabeth I, she's so great, she says, they're not going to blow me up, the people love me. She strikes up a really personal relationship with the public around her. It's an investment, an investment in the hearts and minds of the people. After Elizabeth I, the informal walkabout is never used again, until Elizabeth II finally brings it back. Both queens were aware of the need to, I suppose what we'd call it today, press the flesh, to be seen to be believed, to be out there engaging with the people, you know, sprinkling a bit of magic and stardust on them. And both reigns coincide with new forms of mass media, which they use to rebrand themselves with a carefully crafted image, designed to fit their era and their power. One was a hands-on executive monarch, ruler, dictator in many ways of the country. But by the time Elizabeth II has come to the throne, Parliament has got power. And Elizabeth II exerts a sort of imaginative power over the country. Both Elizabeths had to find a language for their female monarchy. They went for very different images, but the impulse is there. In the 1960s, Elizabeth II invites television cameras in for unprecedented access to her family life. They beam a confident new version of the Queen into millions of British households. In 1960 there is this wonderful, intimate portrayal of the Queen and her young family at Balmoral. She looks more at ease, far removed from just a few years before. Now Elizabeth is a mother, but she's comfortable with her children and her family around her. Even the pet corgis in the background. This is an image that in the 20th century would have been relevant and appealing to her subjects. This is a monarchy that recognises that it needs to move with the time and what better way of harnessing the power of technology and television to achieve this in a single sweep. So it's a brilliant move. And I can remember as a boy watching that with absolute fascination. Look, there's the Queen, there's Prince Philip, and they're just like us. And that was the intention, I think. And for most of my life, I have thought of the Queen as a kind of alternative mum. And a lot of people must, must have grown up feeling that way. Elizabeth I was also using new forms of mass media, but in her case, it's a little-known piece of Tudor technology. Using a tracing technique called underdrawing, she sets out a commanding new look. We have here three images of Elizabeth I, which you'd be forgiven for thinking are identical. And this was achieved by a technique known as underdrawing. So Underneath the paint, you would have an outline of the monarch that has been, if you like, pre-approved by the monarch and her government. And this ensured, as you see here in these three images, an almost identical replica of the Queen's likeness. We've got the very determined expression. We've got her arrayed in black. Black also, of course, provides the perfect foil for all of this wonderful gold and pearl jewellery. She is undeniably a Tudor monarch. Elizabeth bans previous portraits. And using this technique, her new regal... You would have one of these images in your home. It ensures that across the land, and indeed even overseas, there can be one clear, striking and powerful image of Elizabeth as she wanted to be perceived by her subjects. Tudor propaganda, I suppose, at its most effective. Elizabeth I knows they want Gloriana, the Rainbow Queen, excess and perfection. It's all about diamonds, it's all about excess, it's all about bling. But you'll very rarely see Elizabeth II in all the bling. She prefers not to. It's all about dressing as if it looks frugal and modest. It's a tartan family portrait. But both of them are keenly aware of what the nation wants. They are both mistresses of royal spin. 
And the similarities don't end there. On the surface, the shy and moderately introspective Elizabeth II could not be more different from the extrovert and glittering Queen Elizabeth I with all her executive powers. But actually, at the core of each woman is a very strong will, real pride, real ambition for themselves, for their position, and for their country as a whole. They come from families who don't privilege girls' education, and yet both of them are absolutely brilliant, and they are the cleverest, most intelligent monarchs I think that we've had. Elizabeth II is an absolute genius with her papers and with her memory. Elizabeth I, she knew Latin, really, as a toddler. Elizabeth I wasn't a sort of wilting flower and a very delicate woman, such as the ideal was at the time. She loved hunting. She would spend hours on end engaged in the chase, and actually she wouldn't flinch from making the kill herself. And I think parallels can be drawn there to Elizabeth II. Certainly not a fragile female role model at all. When we think of queens in general, we think of these kind of revered figures who are sitting on thrones the whole time. But actually there was this kind of normality connecting with her horses and the outdoors. And I think that is a nice common human fact that does actually unite these two queens. Both women share a strength of personality and after a difficult start, have proven themselves to their people. But overseas, trouble is brewing. Crisis of international relations. They may be in different eras, but they will both need to prove they have the diplomatic skills to cope. Elizabeth and the Tudor state start creating a space for England in terms of other countries. And then it has huge repercussions, it has huge implications on the later history of English interaction with the wider world. When Elizabeth I comes to the throne in 1559, her kingdom is an isolated island rejected by the Catholic nations in Europe. England is not a global power. They are on the margins at this point. And Elizabeth, around the middle of her reign, she really begins to understand that England needs to do something about this. Elizabeth wants to expand her nation's horizons acquire new riches, and spread her influence across the globe. So she welcomes a band of intrepid new explorers into her court. Wily mariners like Walter Raleigh and Francis Drake. And with her blessing, they explore and settle lands all over the New World in the Caribbean and North America. Overseas expansion under the auspices of Sir Walter Raleigh and Sir Francis Drake and the like, brings Elizabeth great wealth. They're bringing ships laden with gold, they're bringing exotic spices and all these expensive foodstuffs. And of course, they also flirt with her and her male commanders circumnavigate the globe and plant the flag of England in her name but it also brings trouble. There is piracy amongst Elizabeth's navy, seizing gold bullion from Spanish ships. It causes diplomatic incidents. It excites the hostility of some of the most powerful leaders in the world. But Elizabeth I proves a master at smoothing things over. Using the diplomatic skills she's honed as a young woman in the tempestuous Tudor court, she charms the irate Spanish ambassadors and even adopts their national dress. Here we have a particularly striking portrait of Elizabeth I. What I think is really interesting about this is the silhouette of the monarch here, quite extraordinary, this huge, wide farthingale skirt is a Spanish style. And by incorporating this extraordinary silhouette from Spain, Elizabeth is making a really strident, clear statement about the importance of internationalism, the cosmopolitan nature 
to visits from foreign ambassadors. She always makes sure to show every courtesy so that they will write home about the English Queen's generosity, about her refinement and the culture of her court. So she makes sure they have a good time. But the swashbuckling days of Elizabeth's court mask a very difficult legacy overseas. In England's new empire, the indigenous people are oppressed, displaced, and even traded. So this is a letter from John Hawkins, one of Elizabeth's great adventurers, and he's sort of boasting of his exploits, really. This is all the beginnings of Elizabeth's empire, and he talks, really, about slavery, because uh, he refers to some Negroes in Guinea and has been able to sell them uh, in the West Indies uh, in return for gold, pearls and emeralds. This is the darker side of Elizabeth's empire, and it's something that will have ramifications 400 years later that her namesake, Elizabeth II, is going to have to deal with. By the time Queen Elizabeth II comes to the throne, many of the colonies are finally freeing themselves from the shackles of empire and declaring independence. And in the new dawn, there is understandably a lot of resentment towards their old imperial masters and the British monarchy. One of the great issues facing Elizabeth II at the beginning of her reign is a poisoned chalice going back to Elizabeth I. She started to create this great British empire and which then crumbled. All these countries could easily have decided to cease having Elizabeth as their head of state. And yet, somehow, this small, unassuming woman has become the totem, the glue that holds them all together. As Elizabeth II sets about confronting the dark history of empire, she starts to display many of the same diplomatic skills as her Elizabethan predecessor. She reinvents herself as queen of a new commonwealth of independent nations. And as she travels around her dominions, she wins over the foreign public by embracing their culture and even their national dress. In 1977, the Queen Travrone, and we see her here being given a Maori cloak, which she is about to wear. Elizabeth II, in being given this Maori cloak, is showing a acute awareness, I think, of the need for an international diplomacy, showing the need for a sensitivity to other cultures, the cultures of her Commonwealth. Um, and that's important both for Elizabeth II and Elizabeth I, as both have these expanding empires. So that need for an international diplomacy, a sort of cosmopolitan rule, becomes so crucial in the projection of their individual identities as rulers. I think we really can say that Elizabeth II has proved to be, in her own quiet way, an internationalist and a diplomat as skillful as Elizabeth I. This has been one of her great achievements, creating this family of nations around the world. They basically just say, as I think most people do, she's just the queen. That actually Elizabeth II is just kind of queen of everywhere. She is queen of the world. From the perspective of the world stage, history will see Elizabeth II as a more active and a more important monarch. and. Elizabeth I, her reach extended across Europe and beyond. But despite all they've achieved, the road from here will not be a smooth one for either queen. They will soon be tested by entirely new challenges that threaten to derail their reigns. Just around the corner for both of them would be a huge threat in the face of a rival woman and undoubtedly, for each of the Elizabeths, this would be the most dramatic moment of their reign. Next time, Elizabeth I and Elizabeth II deal with the end.
Mary of Mary, Queen of Scots, and Princess Diana into the royal circle. Their beautiful rival's tragic tales will push both queens into uncharted waters and ultimately define their reigns.